Hello everybody, Shrouded Hand here. So the other day I had an 8 hour long power cut in my house and I also forgot to charge my phone so I was left for an entire day with no access to any kind of electronic entertainment and no way of making any videos. So what I did was I pulled out all my books on ghost hauntings and had a look through for some inspiration. And I thought what I would do was collect together some of the more creepy ghost stories from these books. And then once the power comes on, I'll record them for a good old school style narration video. So sit back, relax and enjoy the stories. This one comes from a book called Ghost Station 6 by Bruce Barrymore Halpenny. The headquarters of Kingston ATC Squadron is haunted by the suitcase ghost, or so it is alleged. Many people have reported hearing heavy footsteps. Very strange, for the floor is carpeted. So it has to be haunted. If so, by whom? The answer must come from a certain suitcase, for whenever anyone looks into the suitcase, the ghostly footsteps are heard, as if it is resenting the intrusion into the suitcase. Inside the suitcase is a Royal Flying Corps uniform that is said to have belonged to Captain James McCudden, who won the Victoria Cross in the First World War and was mysteriously killed. McCudden was one of the greatest airmen in both the First and the Second World Wars. He was in a class of his own. James McCudden was born on March 28, 1895 at Gillingham, Kent. He joined the Royal Flying Corps as a mechanic in May 1913. He got his commission on January 1917. The following month, McCudden won the Military Cross with a bar in October of the same year. In April 1918, he was awarded the Victoria Cross and a citation read, for the most conspicuous bravery, exceptional perseverance, keenness and very high devotional duty. Captain McCudden has at the present time accounted for 54 enemy aeroplanes. In July 1918, James McCudden was promoted temporary major and killed at Marquis on leaving to take over his new squadron. The last thing he told his Batman was, look after my new uniform in my suitcase. McCudden was flying on ahead but he never made it. His aircraft crashed in mysterious circumstances. It was not an enemy aeroplane that brought him down. So beware. If you touch the RFC uniform in the suitcase at the HQ of Kingston ATC Squadron, you will incur the wrath of Captain James McCudden, for that RFC uniform is surely his. The ghostly footsteps are there to warn you to stay away from the suitcase. Take heed. The next story comes from Northumberland Stories of the Supernatural by Michael James Hallowell. Cresswell is a small village in Northumberland, which lies not too far to the north of Ashington. It sits upon the coast, looking out over the tempestuous North Sea. The contrast between the roar of the sea and the silence of Cresswell at dawn couldn't be more striking. Several years ago, my colleague John Triplo found himself becoming increasingly intrigued by the folklore surrounding Cresswell. He started to collect eyewitness testimonies of people who had seen bizarre animals, ghosts, UFOs and other paranormal phenomena in the area. One tale seemed to catch John's attention more than the others though, and he put out an appeal in a local magazine, asking readers if they had any personal recollections of it. His goal? To find out the truth about the grey ghost or grey lady of Creswell. It seems that during the early 1940s, there was a young girl in Ashington by the name of Margaret Moffat. Margaret was employed by a local lad called Jimmy Padreddy, who ran a small family bakery in Cresswell. Now Margaret's normal routine was to get up early every morning and make her way from Ashington to Cresswell on foot. Sometimes though, if she managed to get to the village of Ellington in time, she'd hitch a lift with the pitmen heading back to Cresswell after finishing their shift at Ellington Colliery. On one particularly inclement morning, a thick fog had settled. Margaret boarded the tanky, as pitmen called their carriage. As the vehicle headed along Cresswell Road towards St Bartholomew's Church, something astonishing happened. Margaret, along with several of the miners, suddenly saw the ghostly form of a woman as it walked across the road. The spectre then simply faded away. 
What struck Margaret as distinctly odd was the fact that the pitmen seemed completely unfazed by the incident and, after a momentary pause, simply carried on talking. There was a good reason for this. It wasn't the first time they'd seen her. The grey ghost of Cresswell, sometimes described as wearing a flowy grey dress, had in fact been espied many times before. It wouldn't be the last time that Margaret Moffat would see the grey ghost of Cresswell either. Not many days after her first glimpse of the grey ghost, Margaret turned up for work as usual. Jimmy Pedretti was loading up his cart with freshly baked goods in preparation for making the morning deliveries. Margaret, as usual, planned to accompany him. The employer and his employee were just about to set off when, without warning, the horse whinnied alarmingly, reared up and then galloped off in the opposite direction to the one they normally took. Naturally, Jimmy wanted to know what had spooked his horse so badly. So did Margaret. As they both turned to peer down the road, they were flabbergasted to see none other than the grey-gowned ghost of Creswell, hovering there gracefully, just before she faded into mist. Years later, after Margaret had married and had children, she would often reminisce about her two encounters with the ghosts. Unfortunately, she passed out of this life in 1999 and so can no longer regale friends and family alike with her memories. Till the day she died, however, she was resolute in her claim that what she had seen was nothing more and nothing less than the Grey Lady of Creswell. The next story comes from a book titled The Hangman, The Hound and Other Hauntings by Thomas Coram Caldus. The spectre of an old woman haunts the winding back road to Rill from Prestatin and Dizeth, a road known in the area as the Old Rill Road. She was sighted for the first time in the 1960s. On a stormy and rainy night, Anne Williams and a friend were driving along the Old Rill Road when she noticed a woman walking along the road in the downpour. They decided to offer the old lady a lift and reverse the car. Soon they reached a stretch of road where the old lady could have been, but there was no one at all. This was somewhat of a mystery. The road was flanked by high hedges, and it appeared to be improbable that the elderly lady had climbed over them. Anne soon forgot the incident. Sometime after the strange occurrence at Old Rill Road, Anne got married. One evening she mentioned her encounter with the elderly lady to her husband, and was surprised to learn that he had met her too. Her husband knew for sure that the old real road was haunted. He had seen the old lady a few times when she was still alive and also after her death. The phantom woman appeared to Anne's husband when he was travelling to Rill on the old real road on a rainy night. He stopped to give the old woman a lift. How amazed he was when he realised that she had vanished. He still remembers that the old woman wore a white raincoat. The ghost of the old lady in white seems to be quite active. Four shift workers were driving home one night on the old real road when they sighted the spectre. The white lady stepped on the road right in front of their car. They clearly felt the impact of the collision and stopped all at once to help the accident victim. When they got out of the car they discovered to their great surprise that the woman had disappeared. The white lady was witnessed as recently as 2005. Witnesses saw her partially covered by a wall on 1st of January 2005. She was seen leaning over the wall and vanished all of a sudden. The next story comes from a book titled True Ghost Stories from World War I and World War II. Ghost Soldier in Our Attic by Etna Elliott. My husband and I, with our three children, left Portland, Oregon in the hot summer of 1928 to join my parents in the high mountains of California, five miles from Georgetown, where they had purchased a gold mine and were working on it together with my Uncle Charlie. There were no buildings at the mine and they rented an old farm which was badly in need of repairs. It had been unlived in for several years and my family spent some time making it livable, so it was comfortable by the time we reached there with my family. During the day, while the men were busy at the mine, Mother and I went to work in the attic, which we reached by a very narrow, steep stairway. We piled old trunks, boxes, a very tiny old-fashioned organ, an old music box, and other discarded articles of the departed family, all in one end of the attic. As we were working, I suddenly felt as if someone had walked up behind me, 
but turning I saw nothing but the cobwebs which hung from the peak-roofed ceiling. I told Mother that I had the odd feeling of being watched, but she only looked at me queerly, then talked of other things. Later on I ran downstairs to get something for Mother. As I came back up the steps, someone brushed by me, almost knocking me back down the stairs. Still, I couldn't see a thing, although I had felt the contact distinctly. We worked up in the attic for several days before we had it ready for use. During all that time I felt an unseen presence near me. After what had happened on the stairs I wouldn't let my mother out of my sight and followed at her heels the whole time. We had put two beds side by side in the narrow room, leaving only a two foot space between them. Then we hung thin lace curtains in the doorway to hide all the things piled at the other end of the attic. Air from the two windows at each end would circulate through the area where we were to sleep. My husband did not like the idea of going up into that hot attic to sleep, so he put his bed under an old apple tree near the front porch. Therefore, our small daughter and I slept in one bed, and our two boys in the other. That first night I was terribly nervous, so my mother turned the paraffin lamp down low and said to just let it burn if it would make me feel better. But even with the light burning, I still could feel that unseen presence. And I don't think I slept over five minutes the whole night. I was terribly tired the next day, but I still could hardly bring myself to go to bed that night. Finally, the children could not be kept up any longer, and I slowly climbed those steep stairs with cold chills running up into my hair. I got the children into bed and climbed in beside my little daughter. I forced myself to close my eyes and finally fell asleep only to be awakened much later by an icy wind blowing over my body. With my eyes wide open, in the dim light of the paraffin lamp, I saw him. Standing just outside the lace curtains was a young soldier in uniform. He was tall and straight and looking intently at me as if he was about to speak. The curtains blew out towards me and he started moving in my direction. I screamed but then I was unable to move until my parents came dashing up the stairs. I sobbed out what I had seen, and I thought there was a look of horror on their faces. My mother slept up in the attic with us the next night, but she wouldn't talk much about it the next day. The following night I forced my feet up the stairs. I didn't want the children to know how frightened I was. Mother stayed up there with us until the children were asleep and I had become quite calm. I tried to make myself believe that I had imagined the whole thing, and when the morning came and there had been no frightening experiences during the night, I almost believed this. A week passed and I was feeling quite safe as I went to bed, and almost at once I fell into a sound sleep, only to be awakened about two o'clock in the morning. I felt as if someone had shaken me. I sat right up in bed, wide awake and trembling. My body was cold as ice. There, sitting on the edge of the other bed, right against my small son, was the same young soldier. He was looking into my face, smiling, and he had his elbow on his knee. He held a hat in his hand, which was swinging back and forth. I recognised the hat as a soldier's hat of World War I. It had a wide brim with a heavy, bright cord around the crown. It, or a hat like it, had been hanging in the hall when my parents moved into the house, and I had been wearing it as a sun hat since coming to the mines. Now this ghost soldier had the same hat in his hand as he smiled at me, with his face not over a foot from my own. He leaned towards me, closer and closer. I never remembered making a sound, but I must have, for my parents were soon there. This time I could still see the soldier, long after they were in the room. I was weak and trembly for several days after that, and my dad put up a cot at the other end of the attic, just outside of the lace curtains, and slept there himself every night. So things settled down and I began to think and hope that I would not see the soldier again. When I quietly slipped into bed beside my daughter on this particular night, I felt quite safe with my dad so near. Turning on my side with my face to the wall, I was soon fast asleep, but sometime in the early morning hours I was suddenly wide awake and again as cold as ice. A large heavy hand was pressing down on my shoulder. I tried to rise but I was held tight by this pressure. Turning my face up, I found myself looking right into the eyes of the soldier. His face was only inches from mine, and I still felt his hand as plainly as I have ever felt the hand of my husband. I felt as if I were dying. I still think I would have died, and the soldier would have taken me with him, except at that very instant, 
My small daughter sat up in bed screaming the most unearthly screams I had ever heard. Still it seemed her screams receded farther and farther away from me. To this day, that child, now a grown woman, thinks a soldier was taking me away. Her screams of course brought dad and mother, and my mother had her arms around me before that soldier took his hand from my shoulder. They finally got me downstairs and in my hysterical condition I managed to make them understand that I wanted their children brought down here at once. My dad and husband hurried to do this and my mother held my little daughter until she cried herself to sleep. We sat in the kitchen the rest of that awful night. My husband was very doubtful of what I'd seen. He said he wanted to sleep upstairs the next night and see for himself what was going on. I begged him not to but he was determined. He went off to bed and the next morning he said that he'd slept fine. This continued for almost a week. Then one night, about midnight, he came bounding down the stairs, blankets and all. We could never get him to say what he'd seen or what had happened. He was very pale and said only that he would never sleep up there again and that this house should be burned and the ashes buried. Then, in the bright light of day, my parents told us what the old lady had said to them when they rented the house. She had looked at them for a long time and then said, You are welcome to live in the place, if you can stand it. Pointing to great piles of rocks all over the place, she continued, See these rocks? Well, I've piled them just to have something to do to keep me outside the house. But my husband still lives there, although he has been dead many years. Then she added, yes, and the boys come back too, so I have left the house to them most of the time. She explained that her husband had died in a drunken stupor in that house. One of her sons had dropped dead on the back porch. Her younger son had died in the kitchen whilst having a fist fight with his brother. And her eldest son, a soldier in World War I, had come home after being wounded and died in his sleep in his bed in the attic. This house is bad, she's gone on to say. But if you can stand to live amongst them, you are welcome. Now at last my parents believed her. The men went to work at once and built a large cabin at the mine. My husband and I stayed there only long enough to help my parents move out of that house with its ghostly inhabitants before returning gratefully to our home at Portland. The next story comes from a book named Hauntings by Rebecca E. Kidger. In a family home in Bolton, Lancashire, the apparition of a child has been witnessed when darkness has fallen. One night, the dad of the family, who lived in the house, was fast asleep in bed when his young son came into the room and got into bed with him and his wife. This happened often as the young boy suffered from frequent nightmares. The dad got out of bed and went and got into his son's bed so that he could all sleep a little more comfortably. As he got into the bed, he lay on his side, but he felt uneasy, as if someone was there, and turned over to face the other way. To his amazement, there, standing by the bed, was the figure of a child who had pulled up a t-shirt over his face, just as a footballer does when he scored a goal. Assuming that the child was his son coming to get back into his own bed, the man asked the child a number of times if he was okay, but got no reply. Bemused, he then began to get out of bed, but as he did so, the figure began to walk backwards, away from him. Asking the child again what was wrong, he glanced down at the child's feet and noticed that the figure was not walking, but instead was floating backwards towards the bedroom wall, through which it then disappeared. Is it possible that this ghostly child had been visiting the son of the family often, causing the boy to believe that he was having nightmares? Or was this a one-off visit from a child now residing in the afterlife? Since then the apparition has not been witnessed again, but this haunting happening has certainly stayed with the family, for they sense the apparition of the child could well reappear at any time. The house itself doesn't hold a bounty of other paranormal activity, but the bottom of the stairs are said to be freezing cold whatever time of year, and no matter how warm the rest of the house is. People also get the feeling that they don't want to dally on this spot and tend to rush over it. Whoever this young child was who visited the family home that night, it would seem that he definitely had some form of attachment to the house. And the final story comes from a book named Ghosts Over Britain by Peter Moss. 
It has been said before that the bizarre nature of many contemporary supernatural experiences gives them a unique air of authenticity. The flimsy, translucent, fancy dress figure at midnight could so easily be a mental regurgitation of a stock ghost story or TV play, and must, in the absence of any corroborative evidence, be looked at very carefully. The experiences of Miss Violet Nichols of 18 Hall End Lane, Pattingham, a semi-detached house built around 1930, began in this almost stereotyped routine way, but soon developed into something much more extraordinary, almost indeed grotesque. One night in 1952, Mrs Nichols says that she woke up and saw, standing in the bedroom, a young woman in her mid-twenties with a beautiful complexion, long blonde hair and a full-length yellow dress, marked at the waist like a half-moon. Terrified of the stranger, she woke up her husband who reluctantly searched the house. Not finding anything, he was very annoyed and returned to sleep. Violet, very disturbed, remained awake, and then in the darkness saw the bedroom door open. The same woman put her head in, looked around, and, apparently assured that all was right, vanished. A week later, about midday, Violet was alone in the house, and looking out of the kitchen window, she saw the same young lady, her hair swinging, her cheeks glowing, coming up the garden path. Extremely surprised, Violet saw the figure pass the kitchen door and then vanish, disappearing forever from her life. Unless, of course, the terrifying incident which occurred six years later is in some strange way connected with the lovely female phantom. In 1958, Violet, then aged 40, was living on her own with her five-year-old son, Christopher John. One evening, as usual, she sent him up to bed to undress, and then followed a few minutes later to tuck him into bed. She found him staring in utter bewilderment at the floor near the fireplace. Look, Mum, he whispered in an awed voice, pointing to a large knot hole in one of the boards. Violet looked, not expecting anything but some trivial mark, but then, almost too astonished to believe her own senses, she saw a pale, blue, but unmistakably human eye staring up at her. She and Christopher stood transfixed with fear and amazement as the eye, which at first seemed to be frightened and then cautiously watchful, glared unblinkingly upwards. From time to time it moved up and down within the limits of the cavity beneath, as if trying to escape. Finally it drifted slowly to one side, but did not vanish out of sight until between 5 and 10 minutes later when it faded away. Christopher, now married and with the scepticism of his twenties, confirms the story exactly, but can offer no explanation for the strange events of that evening, which have never in any way been repeated. So that's the end of the stories and I hope you enjoyed them. It feels quite good to get back to doing one of these old school style narration videos. I haven't done one of these in a while and I like to mix up the content. I also like to pick old books as sources because I, I feel like quite a lot of the ghost stories on Reddit have been heard before. So these ones probably have a better chance of being new to the audience. Um, I'm not sure if you've heard these ones before. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed, please give it a thumbs up. If you're not subscribed already and you liked the video, please hit the subscribe button. And if you want to help support the channel, check out the link to the merch store. All the artwork on there is designed by me. I love doing weird drawings and doodles, so it's nice to see him put on a t-shirt as well. And to think that some people are walking around wearing it. A strange thought, but kind of amusing. Until next time, goodbye.